Hey everyone, this is Camilla from the Addendum Podcast, and in this week's episode, I have had the chance to talk with the super super awesome lab technician and sensational podcaster Roa Cho. In this episode, we discuss Roa's experience learning Japanese and how that encouraged her to study the interconnected history behind the development of languages in the Sinosphere. I hope you guys will enjoy this episode. I had so much fun chatting with Roa, and without further ado, let's get on with the episode. All right, today we're here with Roa Cho. Would you like to give a quick introduction to our viewers about your occupation here at the college? Yes, of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Roa. I am currently working at Marinopolis College as a physics lab technician. So if you are a science student, you might have already had me in your labs or maybe in the future. And I'm relatively new here at the college, so I haven't been here that long. I think about two years. And yeah. I would just also like to mention that Roa has a podcast very popular among the Marinopolis student body. So we will link that in the description down below. So do go and check that out. If I understood correctly, you are Korean. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And、um, you also speak fluent Korean. So would it be okay if we dive into the topic of your experience learning Korean growing up and, you know, just that experience as a whole? Sure. So I moved to Canada when I was six. So I was born in Korea, but my family immigrated here when I was quite young. So I did all of my schooling here ever since elementary school. I kept my Korean because we spoke Korean at home. I have two older siblings. And so I think that helped a lot. Of course, we now mix a lot of the two languages. We speak Korean and English both together. But yeah, I would say. Like, if I had to categorize myself, I would say I am fluent in Korean, but I'm definitely more comfortable speaking English. But yeah, I can read, I can write, I can speak, I can, you know, converse with adults. I say that because it's a, it's a little harder to talk to adults <laughs> than、sure. just, you know, my friends or anyone younger. But yeah, so I use Korean quite a bit on a regular basis. That's awesome. And、um, I heard you also recently started learning another language. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? Sure. So I'll give you a little bit of a background. This must have been now, I guess, about two years ago. I don't know. Last year kind of doesn't count in my mind, but <laughs> let's say two years ago. I had a friend who actually really wanted to seriously learn Japanese. So, I wasn't as serious about it, but I thought, you know, might as well learn together a little bit. It's always nicer to have someone to learn a language with, right? I knew that Korean and Japanese are very close. There are a lot of historical crossovers. And so, I thought it would be cool to see that. Now, I didn't know how much. Similarities, how many similarities there actually are. But yeah, I started learning Japanese, and because of that, I learned so many more things than I expected. I wouldn't describe myself as someone who loves to learn languages. I don't have an affinity for languages, like, I don't love it. <laughs> I just started doing it out of a whim, but I started getting interested in Asian linguistics ish. Like, I don't want to make it sound too fancy because I didn't actually do any research on that or whatever, but I <laughs> was interested in and I started learning certain, you know, historical events that happened. And it was, it's just a whole other thing now for me. And、um, through that experience, did anything notably、um, stood out? Especially regarding the importance of language. Like, how did that experience change the significance of language for you? So, I think, I mean, I started reading into languages. Like, like you were saying, the importance of languages. I was very grateful that I was able to speak and read and write in Korean because if I didn't, Like, I would not have taken on Japanese. Like, it would have been too much, <laughs> you know? And so, I'm grateful that I grew up. You know, speaking and using Korean with my family. And then it got me thinking a whole lot about, like, you know, other immigrant kids. Like, I have friends who are Korean and who do not speak Korean very much in their household. They speak mostly English. And so they didn't get to hold on to that 
And so there's always this question about like how much of your mother tongue should you actually retain, Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you could um, talk about your own experiences too. But when immigrant families come here, there's like, I've heard, I don't, I didn't experience this myself, but I've heard of other families and parents who want their children to learn English more so than their mother tongue, just so, you know, you could successfully integrate into this new country and, you know, be successful. You're going to do all your studies in English, so you might lose your mother tongue altogether. But, you know, if you have to choose, a lot of people choose English because that's the language we speak here, you know? And so um, that opened a whole new question for me to think about. Have you ever had to face something like that where you maybe feel like you have to let go of your mother tongue for English? Um, So thank you for the question. And yeah, as Rose was saying, I myself am also an immigrant. So my first language isn't English either. And we do speak Vietnamese here at home. Me, myself, it's not so much with English because I have a very positive relationship with English, but it's more so with French and especially coming here to Quebec and pressure for immigrant kids to, you know, catch up with the French and really be able to use it in a practical context. Um, that for me was a lot more pressure and it was similar to the experience that you were describing, Rua. But yeah. That's interesting. I actually went to a French elementary school, French high school. So I also know French. I don't love French. Like (laughs) I spent, what was it, like 10, 11 years in a French school. I guess I could say I'm probably as comfortable with French as I am with Korean. Like those are kind of on a similar level, whereas English, I'm much more comfortable uh, expressing myself in English. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm very much aware of how the Korean and Japanese languages are popular these days. Mm -hmm. And so I thought also, like, it's interesting to talk about, you know, bilingualism and um, us immigrants in an English country and all that but Japanese I think has been popular for longer like people have wanted to learn Japanese have you ever gone through that phase like do you watch anime (laughs) or like other Japanese shows yeah I I think I definitely have I know my brother is going through it right now (laughs) what about you I don't watch anime um not that I have anything against I just never got into it I feel like I if I got into it I would really get into it um but I just never I just never did and um Korean I think is more recently become popular a lot of people want to learn Korean especially because of k-pop and (laughs) k-dramas for the record I love k-pop and I almost exclusively only listen to k-pop i don't listen to any other genre of music but i don't watch k-dramas oh you don't are no (laughs) like i've watched i guess a few in the past but it's been a while and it's k-dramas i i've given it a shot uh not like anime anime i didn't really give it a fair shot but k-drama i've tried it there are some dramas that I really liked in the past, but overall, I didn't love K-dramas as a whole. So I see. It's just not my preference. <laughs> yeah, I have a few friends who are very deep into K-dramas, and right. I love binge-watching things, and yeah. so it would just not be healthy for me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, why I chose this topic is I think a lot of people would be interested in hearing about, you know, someone else's experience learning Korean and Japanese. So I thought, first of all, might as well um, talk about the languages themselves, because I think it is of interest. So just getting into the structure and like components and elements of Korean and Japanese. First of all, like I said, they are very, very similar. They're mutually unintelligible, meaning like if someone was speaking Japanese to me, I wouldn't be able to understand um, with my Korean background. You know, the pronunciations have adapted res- uh, respectively, but everything else, like in terms of vocabulary, in terms of grammar, especially, is like 90 something percent the same, which is 
when I first realized that, I was mind blown. You know, like I had no idea. Why didn't anyone oh, wow. ever tell me? Like, does everyone just know this? <laughs> and I, because it's so obvious. It's so obviously similar. Did that make you want to look deeper into the history behind the languages, like noticing、yes. similarity? Absolutely yes, and so like every time I would find a word that is the same in both languages, it would just get me so excited. It would give me so much joy, you know, like because it's so <laughs> cool. So yeah, so for those of you who don't know, Korean right now, well, written Korean, we use a phonetic alphabet. So it's much like the Roman alphabet where we have phonetic letters. I think there's ten consonants and fourteen vowels. Um, it wasn't like that always, but now it's been like that for a while. If you've watched like those traditional time K dramas, maybe you've seen this before. So there was a king in like 15th century or something like that, a few hundred years ago, who invented the phonetic alphabet. And so ever since we use that, but a lot of our vocabulary comes from China. And so before, so the Korean alphabet is called Hangul. So before Hangul, people who would use writing would write in Chinese. So、mm-hmm. there was no written Korean. Maybe there was, but nothing、um, permanent until the invention of Hangul. So. Then, like all the Chinese words were converted into Hangul, but、um, the pronunciations would always adapt to the native language. So, like Mandarin, for example, or Cantonese, like I can't understand、um, Mandarin words, for example. So it's still mutually unintelligible. So the pronunciations changed. But a lot of the vocab still now come from a lot of the vocab has Chinese roots. So something like, like more than half, like sixty percent of our vocab has what we call、um, Sino-Korean. Sino refers to the sinosphere, which it traditionally refers to like the East Asian cultural sphere with China at the center. China was the most influential, so that includes you know East Asia, Southeast Asia, that were influenced historically by China and their dynasties. So all the literature, the religion, traditions was heavily influenced by China and our language as well. So that vocab that comes that has its roots in China, we call that Sino-Korean vocab, and that's. Like sixty percent of our vocab right now. So either it came directly from China or indirectly through Japan or some of the words we invented in Korea. So that is the majority of the vocabulary, and then most of the rest, like thirty thirty five percent, is native Korean, and then the small minority of words, like five percent, are loan words, like mostly from English. When it comes to Japanese, it's a little different. If you've ever studied Japanese or seen Japanese writing, you might notice a bunch of different scripts. So there are three different scripts in Japanese. So there's one called hiragana, katakana is another one, and kanji. Kanji is the Chinese characters, and hiragana is if you ever notice like the more curvy letters, that's hiragana. Katakana is a lot more angular, and so any Japanese sentence can have all three scripts in one sentence, which makes it seem kind of like overwhelming and like a lot. And when you first start, when I first started, I was like, what are all these things? But it quickly makes Sense in terms of their vocab, I don't know what the percentages are. Maybe it's similar to Korea, as in like sixty percent might be Sino Japanese. I'm not sure. But when I was studying, I was mainly studying kanji, which is Chinese characters, because those are the words that you can see in both Korean and Japanese. And like I said, I would get really excited <laughs> when I would see like the similarities. And so when I would read a word written in Chinese characters, and I would read it with Korean pronunciation, it's like a real word that we use like commonly. Okay, like a lot of these words that I was studying. And then you can also read that same word in Japanese pronunciation, and that's also a word that is commonly used. And so there are lots of vocab like that where you could just do one-on-one comparisons. We use the exact same words a lot of the time. Of course, not all of it, but there's. I would say 
at least at least 60% of the vocab that is the same. And so that's really exciting. <laughs> I would get really excited for that. So yeah, when I was studying Japanese, like I said, I wasn't as serious as my friend. And so I would just, you know, look at these words, study them, write the characters, know how to pronounce them and like get really excited. Whenever I would read a sentence in Japanese, what's really cool is I could read it. I could read the sentence in Japanese in my head with Korean pronunciations, and that would be exactly the translation. So it's very one to one, even the grammar and the order of the words. So in English, and I think in Mandarin and the Chinese languages and also Vietnamese, I think um, the order is subject, verb, object. English is like that, where the subject comes first and then the verb and then the object. So in Korean and Japanese, it's not like that. It's um, the verb comes last. So it's subject, object, verb. So for both of them, it's exactly like that. And so when I read a sentence in Japanese, I could directly translate it in Korean without switching the order of the words. And so that's really cool. And that, like you were asking, made me want to learn more about the history of, you know, where that came from. Obviously, I knew that we shared our, some of our roots from China historically, but that also got me looking into the other Chinese languages and also Vietnamese a little bit. The friend that I was studying with, he was Vietnamese. And so that helped a lot. Like we would talk about what is this word in Viet, in Viet? What is this word in Korean? Because we were studying together and we had no idea that our languages were related to each other at all. But a lot of the words are, we use some of the same words and some of the same vocab, which is really, really cool. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Just a quick question on that, because you mentioned your friend being Vietnamese and you both were learning Japanese at the same time and then realizing all these connections between all three or four of the languages. How does that make you feel about the relationship between language and culture? Does that say anything new to you? Any new insights from this experience? One thing that comes to mind is just the fact that there have been and kind of still is a lot of conflict between these four countries. And I don't really really feel like I have to comment on those, but we absolutely have to recognize that we share something so important together. And I don't think that can go ignored. Like you can hate each other all you want right now, but the fact is we share the same root, you know, and language is something so important. We talked about this a little bit in the beginning that one's language means a lot to them. Like it's your culture, it's your history, it's your identity. And the fact that we share that, you can't just ignore that, you know? For me, I didn't know to what air this language, but it turns out it's a lot. <laughs> There's something I wanted to add about the importance of language. So I'll give you a bit of a context about when I really learned how important language is to people, not just to me personally, but people like humanity as a whole. So I was reading this book. Not to plug in my podcast, but, but I was reading this book for my podcast last season, which was in the fall. I was reading a book for each episode and like commenting on that book. So sometimes it would be fiction books, sometimes it would be nonfiction. One of the nonfiction books that I read, the title is long, I might get it wrong, but it was something like the fall of language in the age of English. So it was talking about how other languages will fare when English is just so universal, you know? So there were a few examples that showed how important language is to humanity as a whole. And the examples had very much to do with um, the age of colonialism, where, you know, when colonizers would go into whatever land, one of the things that they always, always do to assimilate is to change their language. If it's British colony, they, they would make the people speak English. And even here, like Native Americans, the colonizers pulled out the children and put them in residential schools and taught them English so they wouldn't learn their native language, right? It's a very effective way to assimilate another culture, to change their language. And then you see how certain countries, a lot of these countries who regained back their independence, always make a point to restore their language. Like it's a way to restore their identity. And so a couple of examples, like India was a British colony for about 150 years or so, and English was their official language during that time. And then when they regained their independence, 
Um, I think they included Hindi as well as like 20 other languages. They granted those languages regional power. And to get rid of the English, they wanted to restore their own native languages. Another example is the Philippines. The Philippines, like the history of the Philippines actually drive me a little insane because <laughs> they were a Spanish colony. Apparent, I didn't know this because I just don't know history at all. They were a Spanish colony for about three centuries, which is like a really long time. <laughs> like... What were you doing in another person's country for three centuries? I think that's ridiculous. Anyways, so during those three centuries, Spanish was the official language in the Philippines. And then I think the late 19th century, the U.S. took over. Again, like, why are you? I don't, you know, I don't get why people go into other people's countries and take it over. Like, can you just leave? Anyways, um, so when that happened, when the U.S. went to the Philippines, took over, both Spanish and English were official languages. And then when the Philippines regained their independence, they're now trying to, this is very recent, like 50, 60 years ago, really. Um, they're, they've given, I think, Tagalog their national language status. But there are certain different languages in the Philippines, like native languages. And so I don't know what the official language is there. English is definitely one of them, but they're including the other ones too. So it's just a way for them to regain their identity back. And I think those examples were very telling. Like it's very obvious that language is important to people and their cultures and identities. So it shouldn't be something that we just overlook. Definitely. So there's this quote that I really liked from that book. So it says, words are not tools for the transmission of culture. They are culture. They are our very selves. And I don't know, for some people, their language or their mother tongue, whether it be some Asian language or English or French or whatever, like maybe they don't consider language that important. Honestly, you can think whatever you want. I don't really care to tell you what to think. But I think whether it's important to you personally or not, you should know that it's been important for humanity as a whole. <laughs> What I noticed was what's really interesting about our conversation a little bit earlier. Um, you were describing the history of colonization and then decolonization and how all of that affected language. Since we were talking about the Southeast Asia region, um, it just occurred to me that because Vietnamese, we use Roman alphabet letters. It's really interesting. It has always kind of not bothered me, but it always made me question the origin of um, the language, since everybody else around us seems to have like Asian characters, whereas we're using Latin characters. And to be completely honest, I'm still not too sure why, but I think you might know a bit more than me about that. Um, so would you care to educate me on that? Yeah. Matter? This is kind of a tangent, but I had to put in Viet in here because I'm so mad about it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'll, I don't know all of it, obviously. I know probably just the basics of what happened. So first of all, from what I know, I think northern Vietnam and the southern coast of right now mainland, I think it's Guangdong. We, we call it Canton province in English. That was one like state together. That was like one region together. And then, you know, things happened. It got separated. I don't really know why it got separated. But anyways, Northern Vietnam was a part of China. Southern Vietnam, I don't really know how that plays into it. But basically, Vietnam or Vietnamese language used to use Chinese script for 2,000 years-ish. And that means that all the literature, all the governmental documents, academic, religious, like everything written was in Chinese. And I think the pronunciations must have adapted as well, just like it did in Korean and Japanese. But they were using Chinese script for thousands of years. And then I think the Portuguese invented Romanized, so Latin script of Vietnamese in, I don't know, like in the 17th century or something like that. But it wasn't standardized for a while. And then when the French came in to take over Vietnam, they made that compulsory. So everyone started learning, you know, it's like the Latin alphabet plus accents. 
because mm -hmm. it's a tonal language. So the Portuguese made it, developed it a few hundred years back. And then when the French came, they made that mandatory education. So all the kids will learn that one and not the Chinese script. So it got lost. And from what I know, like I was saying with Korean and Japanese, how it's 90 something percent the same. From what I hear, I don't know how to speak Vietnamese. I don't know how to speak Cantonese. But apparently that's the same for those two languages. So like, apparently it's very, 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 very similar. <laughs> And I don't know that many Vietnamese here either, but the impression that I'm getting is because a lot of them, a lot of the, the Vietnamese that I have known growing up here, they were a lot more westernized, they were a lot more fluent in English, and I don't think they know, or I don't think a lot of people know that Vietnamese used to use Chinese characters. It's like, well, honestly, how would you know if you literally never learned it or no one ever told you or you never come across anything that said Vietnam used to write in Chinese script? And the reason I'm so mad about this, and it's funny because I don't have any like particular emotional ties to Vietnam. Like it's, you know, a country, they're cool. But I'm so mad <laughs> that that part of history is literally completely lost. Like, like a lot of people don't, I think most people don't know that it used to be written in Chinese. And also, like, as far as you're concerned, like your whole life, you've been writing Vietnamese in like Latin script with mm -hmm. like Roman alphabet plus accents. And it must have been the same for your parents and maybe the generation before that. The French uh, made this compulsory like, beginning of 20th century. So like, let's say 1900s, like 1910, 1915, I don't know exactly. But then, you know, it's been maybe about 100 years, whereas um, Chinese script has had been used for around 2000 years. And what that means is everything that was written before that in Chinese script, like you can't read it. And so all of that is lost. And I'm so mad. <laughs> That, like what the hell they just came in and made everyone learn latin alphabet and like 2000 years of documents unless someone translates it you can't read it people can't read it and so how do you transmit literature from one generation to another if you don't write in the same way and i think it's a little different for like like how I was describing in korean japanese they have their own phonetic writing system but like they made that and they adapted it. And everyone there knows that their language, a lot of it comes from Chinese characters. Like we all know that there in Japan and Korea. In Japan, they have to learn 2136 Chinese characters at school. And in Korea, they have to learn, I think, about a thousand. So it's not a secret, you know. But in Vietnam, I feel, I think a lot of the knowledge is lost. A language just literally disappeared. And that, like, that's a lot to handle <laughs> emotionally. For sure. Wow. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, I've heard bits and bits about um, the French compulsory from my parents, but I've never heard of it to this extent. Wow, this takes it to a whole nother <laughs> level. I do have a question. It's, um, you mentioned, like, due to the switch of alphabets, that whole language, the previous generation of Vietnamese that was written in Chinese characters, is now pretty much lost. But that goes a little bit back to our conversation from earlier, discussing the dilemma of juggling two different languages, one being a Western language, like French or English, and the other being an Eastern one. Because I know a lot of parents in Asia are now having their children learn English, since it seems like it's going to be the new global language, or it already is a new global language, and parents are focusing that their efforts on making sure that their kids can speak English. But what I noticed from that is that slowly but surely, we gradually see less and less of the use of the native language among the youth of Asia. So how do you feel about that? There's a bit of a dilemma surrounding that. Would you like to explore that a little bit? Sure, definitely there's a dilemma. And I kind of get it, you know, not just not only from the parents perspective, but on a national scale, I don't know, I'm not sure how it is in Vietnam, but I know in Korea, learning English as a second language is huge. They get teachers from abroad and that's a significant amount of resources they learn it at 
school from really, really young, all the way up until they graduate from high school. So that's, you know, a solid 10 plus years of English. And I get the intention behind it. Like you were saying, English is a universal language. And that's not a secret. You know, if you don't learn English, you might feel like you're excluded from the global conversation. You're always going to be passive. You're never going to be a participant because, you know, so many things are done in English. And I see this sometimes in sciences because I'm in sciences. Anything science and mathematics related uh, in terms of research, you can be sure that you'll find something written in English. And that is a privilege that English speakers have, whereas any other language, you might not have the resources, you know? And so I definitely get the intention behind wanting to teach English, whether at the family level or the national level. Now, some kind of decision has to be made here or some kind of balance, because you probably noticed by now that I feel pretty strongly about learning these languages, right? <laughs> but for me, I think it's so, so important. Like if I have kids, I'm going to teach them Korean, but it's sort of difficult. Like language learning is not easy for anyone. And so how, you know, it's time consuming. You have to sit down with them and do the work. And like, it's very, very, very unfortunate. And I wish that people would want to learn their mother tongue. There needs to be a better motivation. Yeah. Oh, I'll give you an example of how English being a universal language affects people. Like I said, you feel like you have to learn it. And at the same time, people expect you to know it. You know, it's sort of an expectation. So I'll give you an example of something that happened at our college, I guess about a year and a half ago. This is when I was very, very new to working at the college. And this was when I was just starting to learn Japanese. So we have, we, Marinopolis College, we have a sister school in Japan. And so there's this, like, I call it a program or some kind of school trip where certain students of that college come over to North America. They do a few stops across Canada, maybe even the States, I'm not sure. And they do a stop in Montreal. So they were coming. And I wanted to participate because I had just started learning Japanese and I thought it would be really cool to meet real Japanese people. And it was a very nice experience, first of all. They're really, really super friendly and nice. And I, you know, love interacting with them. The comment that I wanted to bring up here is a lot of people would say, a lot of people at our college would comment saying, you'd be surprised at how little English they speak. And I'm thinking like, why do they have to speak English? <laughs> you know, it's not like they're international students coming to study here. If you're an immigrant or an international student coming to study in an English speaking nation, like you have to speak English to do all your studies and to do everything. So yeah, you have to learn English. But these are Japanese students who live in Japan, going to school there, coming on a school trip. And they were saying how they, they speak very little English. And so that just shows you like, it's just an expectation. You expect people to be able to communicate with you in English, but it shouldn't be. Like, why do you expect them to speak English at all? They don't need it. They don't need to speak it for their daily lives. They have no use for it, really. And so that just, yeah. That was very memorable to me. <laughs> so going back to that book that I read, that I told you about, The Fall of Language in the Age of English, was also talking about this asymmetry that we have. So like I was mentioning, there's definitely an advantage to knowing English. And it's sort of, it's a privilege. There is such a thing as English supremacy, where anything that comes from the Western side, the English speaking nations, has a much easier time penetrating other nations that are non-English. And so really easy examples are like any kind of song, pop songs, or like movies that are produced in the States, that movie is going to be exported into Korea and other East Asian countries. Whereas there could be like the best movie ever in, let's say, the Philippines. I'm never going to see that, you know? So it's always an advantage to produce English language things. Whereas the other way around, like it's so hard for them to come here.
year. And K-pop, K-drama, and Japanese anime, I think these are the exceptions where they it just became so, so popular that it's come here. And there's, you know, there's been a substantial amount of resistance against K-pop here, but it's here. It's here now. And like, you can't, you can't wave it away. <laughs> it's not going away. But those are the exceptions. And it's so much harder for any non-Western country to share their arts, for example. And there's this example that I read, and I think it was a very fitting one. The fact that if I would write a best-selling book in Korean, it's not going to be read here at all. How many Korean books have you seen in like chapters? Like literally none, <laughs> you know? Like, um, I mean, if it was in Korean, it would come here as a translated version of English, but that doesn't really exist here. Whereas any best-selling book here is going to go over to the non-Western market, be translated in like a hundred different languages. And so the reach is astronomically different. And so there's always, there will always be this asymmetrical relationship between the two. And um, another thing that is mind-blowing is um, I was mentioning my mom, so she did all her school schooling in Korea. And I don't know why she ever had to read Shakespeare. Like, they had to read Shakespeare oh, wow. um, at school, in high school. Why? Okay, why do we have to read Shakespeare? That's one thing, because I don't enjoy Shakespeare at all. I don't understand it. <laughs> but why did people it, all the way in Korea have to read authors like Shakespeare? What else? I'm sure she read other, other Western authors. And even if they didn't at school, their authors or books like for example, Les Miserables, there were Korean translated copies when she was young. Or all the Russian authors like Dostoevsky or, you know, those really big names in Russia. Like, why were they very known in Korea? I don't know. <laughs> but we don't see any of the Asian authors here at all, even if they're Asian Americans and um, they have both cultures in them just because they're a little more Asian, just because they're Asian, there is still some kind of resistance against like other cultures infiltrating the market. I'm not going to bring this discussion to racism, but it's racism. <laughs> and also, I mean, it's competition and people here, the markets here will want to reject those. So I get it. But also at the same time, it's racism. Let's not get into the topic of racism. It's just too much. You know how astounding it is sometimes that something can be so obvious but if you don't say it you you just won't you know you just won't think about it it won't be in your conscious mind like I think that's so weird but also like very important to notice yeah yeah trust me like this is all very new to me as well like I am many years older than you but I didn't know I didn't recognize these things until like much later in my life how old were you when you started learning English? Um, I was really young. I think this is really common for a lot of kids in Asia as a whole. Um, I was exposed to English at the kindergarten level, but I started learning it seriously around grade one. That's so yeah. That's when I started learning English. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was here, you know, I was here instead. But yeah, I didn't learn English before that. So I guess you might not have um, experienced too much difficulty just because you were so young. But actually, if you really think about it, there's nothing inherently better or superior about the English language. It just became the universal language because of things that happened. And it's not because it's, quote unquote, a better language. You might ask the question, like, what is the easiest language to learn? I don't know what's the easiest language to learn. L literally, no language is easy to learn. But Spanish is a lot easier to learn than English. So they've done studies like these are actual real credible studies where kids learn Spanish faster than English. First of all, English kind of does whatever the hell it wants. I don't know if you've noticed, but like the pronunciations are inconsistent. And like sometimes this is said this way and not that way. Like it just makes no sense. It's not consistent. Spanish, apparently, I don't know Spanish, but apparently it reads exactly like it looks, which is very nice. <laughs> so it's easier for someone to to learn it. And so English is just our universal language because, first of all, at some point, I think at the peak of the British Empire, whenever that was, like I said, I don't know history that well, 
about a fourth of the earth was Britain or British colonies, which is a lot. And that means all those people had to speak and learn English. And then there's also the fact that after World War II, Britain was sort of on a decline. But of course, its successor is the U.S., which is also an English-speaking nation. And they, you know, the U.S. holds the power of a lot of things internationally, including language. And so English just became a universal language because of those historical events, not because it's inherently better. Actually, French was considered like a beautiful language, like they marketed it that way. And people really <laughs> like consider that the fancy language that you want to learn and be fancy. Right. <laughs> yeah. So for a while, French was like actually an admired, revered language. English was not. So English isn't ever, wasn't ever even considered fancy. About like this whole, you know, English being the better language. I totally agree with your point of view too. Um, and it's just, it's so interesting because what I've noticed is in my recent years living here in Montreal, people expect me to learn their language so they expect me to learn french which i'm not against i mean it's your language like i'm living here in the city where everybody speaks french obviously i should learn to adapt but when i was younger i had english teachers and i was under the expectation that nobody was expecting them to you know adapt to the vietnamese language like it isn't an expectation above their head and although they lived there for years because i had the same teachers for years they weren't under the pressure that you should maybe learn vietnamese and i believe oh my god yes. That's such a good example that you gave. Like, it, it doesn't apply the other way around. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you want to sit down and think about why that is, you know? <laughs> like, why don't we expect that from them? They should. If you're going to live in a country for I don't know how many years, like, if it's just, like, one year, like, fine, okay? But, like, if you're staying there for a while, like, you know, you need, <laughs> you need to speak it or use it, but also other people need I think should expect you to like it, it should be obvious mm -hmm. so okay the next thing I wanted to bring up this is something so important to me in this context and brings us like whole circle of why I'm so interested in Chinese characters so there's this belief it's called phonocentrism that spoken language is inherently superior to written language okay so that's a thing and so just for a bit of context and background so phoneticism is just the state of being phonetic so for example the phonetic alphabet uh, when we write the alphabet they're just symbols that represent sound right and so when we read it we're reading the sounds that are written now I know myself included, like literally no one knows history anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> apparently that wasn't always like that. Right? Like right now we're so used to it and we feel like that's just the way things are, but it wasn't the way things were. Like for the like five, six thousand years during which written language existed, people, most people didn't speak and write in the same language. Okay, and that's partly because written language is much, much more difficult to be developed, whereas spoken language is a little quicker to develop, a little easier. And so what would happen, and this was the same situation within the sinosphere with China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, where there would be one more influential nation that has a written language and so the people in the surrounding regions would go there and learn that written language, but their spoken language would be native, right? So if I'm like a Korean person in ancient times, like I would speak native Korean, but if I wanted to, if I was one of those sort of seeker of knowledge type person, I would go travel to China and, you know, study their scripts and then come back and then speak to my neighbors in Korean. So it's not that we always read and spoken the same language, first of all. So recently, now there has been a thing, I, I don't know how recent, I'm going to say relatively recently compared to the 6,000 years, but I'm sure it's been a few hundred years since phonocentrism has become a thing. Maybe not even a few hundred years. I wouldn't be surprised if it was in the last like 200 years, maybe. Uh, I'm just guessing, but um, where people are 
trying to spread and now believe that spoken language is superior as in more evolved. Uh, so phonetic alphabet, pho like phoneticism is more evolved than languages that are not phonetic. So for example, the Chinese languages. And even within the world, world of phoneticism, there's a hierarchy. And so something like, I don't know if it's something someone invented to make English seem superior, <laughs> maybe, but um, a language apparently, a language that has consonants and vowels is considered more superior than, for example, in Japanese, hiragana and katakana. They are not vowels and consonants. It's phonetic, but we call those syllabaries. And so it's not like a consonant and a vowel, like the consonant H and the letter A come together to make the sound ha. Like their syllabary, they have one letter and it reads ha. So it combines the two. Apparently, that's like less evolved than consonants and vowels. Like, I don't know, people come up with these things. And like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if it's to make English look more superior. <laughs> In all honesty, Korean hangul is like that. It's uh, It has consonants and vowels. And like, they're very proud of it. Like, I mean, good for you. But I don't see a reason why ideographs, like the Chinese language, need to be marketed as less evolved or backwards because that's how people see it now. And just to make it clear, phonocentrism isn't just some like random belief. Like a lot of people internalize this because they believe that English is superior. That that's the language that we should all learn. It's superior because phoneticism is more evolved. When I started learning Chinese characters, I discovered how actually really good these things are. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love them so much. I mean, I'm, again, I'm grateful that I know English. There are a ton of advantages, but that doesn't mean I have to disregard the advantages that ideograms present, okay? And so, like, Chinese characters and other, like, math, like, numbers are ideograms. You know, you don't read it, but you know the meaning of it, and um, the symbol doesn't tell you how to read it. Right. And so Chinese characters are kind of like that. And there's a meaning in that one character. And when I started learning it, I realized it makes a lot of sense. And so though each character has its meaning. And so if you put two characters with each of their meanings together, like each of the characters are so semantically transparent, like you know exactly what those characters mean. And so when you put them together, you form a new word. And it's so much easier to form new words as we progress in time for our language to keep up with the advancement of civilization. Like it's a lot easier to make new words, which is very useful. It's also not just like memorizing everything. First of all, even in a language like English, you have to memorize a ton of stuff. But people think it's just like so difficult and like kind of a nightmare. Um, to learn Chinese, like Chinese is the most difficult language in the world. Yeah, it's hard, but like, calm down. <laughs> there are so many people who use this on a daily basis. And it's not just because like, they're made of something else. It's, it's not especially more difficult. But that's how phonocentrism paints a picture of Chinese characters. It's not like that. It makes a lot of sense. And I think people would benefit from learning a language like this. I've definitely, not only did I learn all of this historical stuff, but I've definitely come to appreciate Chinese characters and I learned a lot. I think it's actually made me smarter, <laughs> kind of in a way. <laughs> so I think people would like benefit from it. I agree with you. I think they're fascinating in a way, um, although they're not they're not the same as English, but that doesn't make them any lesser. In fact, they have like beautiful qualities of their own and very worth exploring as well. Okay, so let's do something fun. Unless you wanted to add something, you can totally add your comments. You no, want. no, no. I think um, let's do that fun thing you were talking about. Yeah, okay. So I don't know if these words are the same or similar sounding in Vietnamese, but there have been YouTube videos of like, especially the ones I watched, it's with a Korean person and a Japanese person. And they give one of the one of the two a card with a word in, on it, 
and they say that word in their native language. So let's say a Korean person says some word in Korean, and the Japanese person has to guess what they're saying because it sounds similar. So we could do something like that. Maybe mm -hmm. um, you could tell what word I'm saying. So there's this word in Korean. Tell me if you can guess what it means, okay? All right. So, jumbi. Um, wait, I know this one. <laughs> okay, no, I give up. It's not hitting. So in Korean, I'll tell you in both Korean and Japanese. So in Korean, this word, jumbi, in Japanese, it's literally exactly the same. It's jumbi. It means um, when you're preparing something like preparation. <gasps> oh my gosh. <laughs> so what is it in Viet? It's almost identical, but yeah? with like a tonal to it. Um, sometimes the consonant sounds are kind of different too, but like overall it sounds very similar. I think Jumbi was one of the ones that are like the most similar among all the languages. So there's also, I mean, these might be different. Um, chui. Not hitting quite yet. <laughs> chui. So in Korean, it's Chui. In Japanese, I think it's like chui, like something very similar. Mm -hmm. That's like when you give a warning. It's <laughs> super similar. Like, yes. And all of these, all of these examples I'm giving you, they have the same Chinese writing. So right. like it's the same characters. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So you know what? I totally get you because when I was first um, immersing myself in Japanese, it wasn't always like, oh, I hear it. You know, I hear it sounds the same. But I, the more you do it, even if it's a word that I never heard of in Japanese, I can hear it and I would have a better guess at what it actually means in Korean without ever having seen or heard that word. So it takes time, but the more you do it, the more you hear it. And then when you say it like kandong in Japanese, it's kando, which is like ah. the same thing. <laughs> Wow. A lot of wow. stuff. And so if, let's say you talk to a Cantonese person, oh, when I mentioned that Cantonese and Viet are very similar, you were nodding. Is it because you already knew that? Or is it because that's like, cool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, really funny story. Um, my friend and I, she is from Hong Kong, so she speaks Cantonese. We were talking about noodles one day. And like, she said what noodles is like instant noodle in Cantonese, I'm like, hang on a second. That's the exact same thing as Vietnamese. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Is it like, does it have the syllable like mian or mian yes. in it? Yes. Yeah. So that's also the same across, oh my goodness. across all the languages. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch. Oh, you know what? Let me plug myself in here for a second. So okay. right now on my Instagram, I'm doing a sort of series of Chinese characters mm -hmm. where I like choose a character that I really like and I, you know, make a post about it and put example words and I put the meaning of that character plus like example words in Korean and in Japanese that they have in common that use that character with like all the pronunciation and stuff. And so if you're interested or if anyone listening is interested, go check that out because I've heard comments from other like Mandarin or Cantonese or even Viet speakers that are like, whoa, I didn't know we had so many words in common. And it just shows you like all of these words that we use on a daily basis or on a regular basis. Um, these aren't just like super, you know, fancy words or anything like that. These are like common words that we all use and we've all been using the same words. <laughs> and it's really cool to see. Maybe to wrap up this episode, do you have any maybe recommendations of resources or books? So I haven't used any of those very common, like they call this Genki, I think. It's a series for Japanese grammar. I haven't used any of those very common resources just because, and like I was saying, I'm very grateful that I already know Korean because it makes it so much easier for me personally. So um, the reference book that I often use is just one, like it's a thick book of all the 21, 36 characters, like kanji characters that students in Japan learn so it's all the characters with all the etymology and all the readings um so if you can find yourself a book like that just of chinese characters it's been very useful to me i'll recommend the book that i've been talking about it's written by a japanese author so her name is mizumura minae and that book was translated into english and that's you know the version that i read and so if you're interested in that book you can totally reach out to me i can lend you what i have and what i love about that book is it's nonfiction, but she's a novelist and so i don't 
I don't like nonfiction books. I read it because I feel like I have to because I don't want to be stupid. But I always just have a much bigger preference for fiction books because they're more fun. But um, she's a novelist. And so there's a certain like storytelling quality to the book. So it was it wasn't that difficult for me to read. So if anyone's interested, please do reach out. If you go to Marinopolis, you can literally mile me. <laughs> Like you'll find me there. If not, you can reach me on Instagram because that's where I'm most active. My Instagram handle is at Roa underscore podcast. Like Camilla was saying in the beginning, I do have my own podcast. So do check that out if you're interested. A link in the description below, guys. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Roa. Thank you, everyone, for tuning to listen. I hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we did during the interview. If you liked this episode, learned something, or just want to help out a bunch of students, please leave a review, write a comment, and share this on social media. If you are listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe and write to us in the comments. All the books and other resources recommended by the interviewee are in the podcast description slash video description depending on your platform, and depending on when you see this, you might be able to use our affiliate link to purchase them. The Marianopolis Addendum podcast is actively seeking local sponsors here in Montreal. So if you are interested, please contact us at the email linked in the description. All the profit generated by this podcast will go back to fund our club's activity. If we have any surplus, they will be donated at the end of every month to a local charity. This episode was edited by Camilla Huang. And the artwork is done by Camilla Huang. The producers and guests associated with this episode may express their opinion, but this podcast does not support any political parties. We only aim to bring different perspectives on different issues through the free exchange of opinions and ideas. We look forward to seeing you at our next broadcast. Cheers!